So um, today we're, we're, we're talking about uh, the use of statistics to um, improve the integrity of research data. Yeah. Now, any statisticians in the room? There's one at the. Uh, you, you're a statistician. When do when does when do you, you usually get involved in research? Do you, you, you do your own research in biostatistics, but when others ask for your help, wh when do they come to you for help? At uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So the, the, there are two times that you're mainly involved in research. That means at the very beginning, when they say, usually it's a sample size estimate, isn't it? <laughs> and the answer is always 100, isn't it? <laughs> you know, they tell you, uh, I, um, I c I've got 100 patients. What's my sample? You know, can you make my sample size estimate? And so you have to make a big effect. So it, so it comes. So, Usually, statisticians are involved at the very beginning and to help with sample size estimations and at the very end to uh, help analyze the data. But what, uh, what I, uh, I'm going to make the case for is actually the, the, the important but neglected role of statisticians in the middle yeah, during data collection. I think that's a really important part place for, statis for statistics to be involved, and that can improve the quality of the data. Yeah? So it's about using statistical methods to check the validity or the accuracy of the data as you're going along in a study. Yeah? So I told you about this study that I, um, so I'm talking, I'm going to start from the beginning about the way you can use statistics to um, uh, help check the data integrity. So in 2009, I mentioned this paper the other day, in 2009 we wrote this systematic review of tranexamic acid in postpartum hemorrhage. And we found all of these trials and we concluded and we believed everything that was written on the paper and we believed that tranexamic acid reduces blood loss. And then, um, but since then I've become, we've become more skeptical. Now, um, we talked about this, about the, big, the most important, this is a randomized trial, very simple, uh, very simple structure. And uh, we talked about the key element of a randomized trial is this. It's, it's the randomization and allocation concealment. And I think it was Tomoko who said that the key word is unpredictable. Is it, was it you? Yeah. So that's the most important thing. The allocation must be unpredictable. Yeah? So that's really important. So if the allocation is unpredictable, then chance and chance alone determines who gets into these two groups. Yeah? And so these two groups should um, differ only by the play of chance. Yeah? They, shouldn't, they, shouldn't, uh, they shouldn't be any differences. There can be differences, but they're chance differences. But there shouldn't be uh, differences over and above the play of chance. Now, we do, um, I, I love uh, randomization because of its fantastic ability to balance baseline variables. So in this big trial we did of tranexamic acid for the treatment of traumatic hemorrhage, you know, this woman's been shot or stabbed in the stomach, and so she's been randomly allocated to tranexamic acid or not. And I, this is the first table in any research paper of a randomized trial. It's the baseline comparisons. So it's comparing those who got the treatment and those who didn't get the treatment, so the drug and the placebo group, um, before they've received the treatment. Yeah? So they've, you collect the information, you've randomly allocated them, and, and you're just looking at the baseline variables. Yeah? And it's fantastic. You know, it's beautiful, I think. They're, 
they're so beautifully balanced, you know. All of these factors, I don't know if you can see it from over there, it's quite uh, difficult to see. But all of these things are, you know, really well balanced, you know. 15.5% had a low blood pressure, 15.9% in the placebo group. Really, you know, so you get a really nice balance. So randomization, when it's done correctly, is really beautiful. Uh, so if you do proper randomization, you'll get two groups that differ only by chance, yeah? And um, who, is, who is talking about doing meta-analyses of studies and finding out that they weren't... Um, you, would, you did a meta-analysis of studies and then you found that the studies weren't... Uh, wasn't... Yeah, so what really happened wasn't mentioned in the paper. Is that what you found? Yeah. Tell us what you found. Yeah. Ah, that's it. Yeah, they they used the word random randomized control trial, but they hadn't really randomized. They were either confused or uh, it was intentional. Okay. <laughs> Ah, I see. Okay. All right. So, this is a good trick that you can do uh, to see if, if studies are really randomized or not, right? So, if they're really randomized, then you, the two treatment groups should differ only by chance. And if you do a meta-analysis of the baseline variables, yeah? Now, usually we do a meta-analysis of the outcome variables, don't we? So, you know, you want to know if, uh, if this treatment has an effect. So you do a randomized trial. You randomize this patient's got get this treatment or that treatment. You follow them along. You get the outcomes in the two groups. And you do a meta-analysis of the outcomes to see what effect the treatment had. Well, now we're doing something different. We're actually doing a meta-analysis of the baseline variables, yeah? And we shouldn't see any average difference, should we? Yeah? And we shouldn't see any heterogeneity over and above chance. Yeah? There shouldn't be any heterogeneity. Do you know what heterogeneity is, everybody? Heterogeneity is like sort of variability over and above chance. Yeah? Callistus? Yeah? So you shouldn't see any overall difference, and you shouldn't see any heterogeneity. So we went back to this meta-analysis we did of tranexamic acid in postpartum hemorrhage. And we did a meta-analysis, this time, of the baseline variables. We had done a meta-analysis of the outcome variables, but now we are actually wanting to learn, actually, were these really randomized trials? Let's do a, a meta-analysis of the baseline variables. So we took a, two key variables. Age is a good one. Age is a prognostic factor for lots of things. And um, it's used always, all, almost always, age is one of the baseline factors. So you can do a, a meta-analysis of age. So we did a meta-analysis of age. And there was a, um, the patients in the treated group were significantly younger. Hmm, that's a bit, so that, that shouldn't really happen. I mean, maybe it could happen really rarely by chance, but it shouldn't really happen. Uh, it makes you a little bit more suspicious. So was, uh, there was a significantly lower, age was significantly lower in the treated group. And an important outcome, an important one considering the outcome is blood loss. The, the, baseline, the baseline hemoglobin uh, so that they're trying to see if tranexamic acid reduces blood loss, and they're measuring the difference in the baseline to the follow-up hemoglobin. And so the baseline hemoglobin was much lower. Um, in the treated group, I'm not sure what direction. Anyway, it should it should be the same ideally, but it was different. And also, it was there was significant heterogeneity. 
these diff differed more than you'd expect by chance alone. So, um, so that's a bit strange. So that made us a little bit more suspicious. Now, what this is new stuff. I, I, um, pe people recently have started using st statistics like this. What you do is you take all of these trials and you work out um, a t-test. Yeah, everybody familiar with a t-test? It's a t-test for the difference. It's a significant test for the difference in the baseline variables, uh, it, oh, the mean difference, the t-statistic, and the uh, absolute value of the t-statistic. And then you rank the studies by the t-statistic. So you rank the study by the size of the difference between the groups. And then you kind of you delete them one after another until you get zero heterogeneity. And then you do a meta-analysis of those studies and see what they show. Yeah? So it's like doing a sensitivity analysis. It's like saying, OK, um, if these studies are properly randomized, um, chance and chance alone should determine who goes into the both groups. We, w we can get differences in the baseline variables, but they'd only be due to chance. And uh, if you do a meta-analysis, you shouldn't see very big differences. But if you do see differences, then you can exclude the studies based on the size of the differences, and then do the meta-analysis again and see what effect it has on the results of the meta-analysis. Is that clear? It's a bit complicated, isn't it? What do you think? Tomoko, in your meta-analysis, tell us about your meta-analysis. What, 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 what were you doing? Extracorporeal. Yes. And uh, there were 12 studies. Uh -huh. And six of them were from the same point of view. And those studies, six studies were very small. Yes. Yeah. 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 Ah. Well, you had a very honest. <laughs> yeah. Oh, it was when you called them, wasn't it? And these were researchers in Japan. OK. And you called them, and they said, oh, it's because it wouldn't get published otherwise. OK. And what did you, what did you do afterwards? Did you do anything? I excluded from my analysis, so it was not even my initial trial. Mm. For my research. Yeah. Yeah. OK. And you'll leave it there. Uh, I don't know, because it's a lower difference. Meta analysis is a lower. Mm. And my teacher is not as good. So I don't know what the ratio is. It's a lot of Yeah. Yeah. Oh, it's an interesting one, isn't it? <laughs> Who who think what what should what do you think Tomoko should do? <laughs> uh, has she done enough? Now she's identified these studies as not being randomized, and she knows that um, th they were said to be randomized so that they could be published, and 
it was intentional. So it puts you in a difficult position now, doesn't it? I mean, it, in a way, I mean, it, it's difficult or easy, depending on how you want to do it. You can say, well, uh, OK. <laughs> but w what, what do people think? What's her responsibility? Or does she have a responsibility here? What do you think? She has the right to expose it. Yeah. And what will happen to her if she does? <laughs> yeah. So it, is, was this a, um, a university? Uh, the researchers yeah. No. I mean, they were a hos local hospitals. OK. Yeah. You, you think what? Uh, yeah, I think it's dangerous. It's dangerous for her. Um, for her to write such words in the paper. Yeah. Since if other, other, author, uh, other readers um, uh, read this, and they would all think, oh, if anyone um, call me and ask me my, my trials, I would not be honest anymore. <laughs> it, oh, I see. Yeah. Actually, a phone call, call if you want to record the phone call, is an evidence. Yeah. Yeah. And you don't know what they're going to say in yes. advance. Yeah. I don't know they're going to to say such things. <laughs> so but why would I record all my phone calls? Even if you write uh, like a letter to the editor, maybe. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I think what you've done is, I mean, uh, most people would think that's reasonable. You know, you've, you've put it in the paper that they, you know, you've investigated and you found they weren't properly randomized. Uh, mm, it's a very <laughs> difficult one, isn't it? But, um, <laughs> the question would be in your manuscript, you have Because if you just say, I, did, I excluded a number of studies because mm. they were not randomized, mm. but me as a reader don't know which studies mm. are these studies. Of course. Oh, you said, OK. Well, at least that's not something. I mean, if I'm in the same area, uh, in the same, your same research area, and I read your paper, I will check which ones were excluded because they were not randomized. Mm. Maybe. I think they'll, other people will do a meta-analysis and they'll include them because most people take them at face value. So they're, they're little bits of dangerous material in the literature. Um, I mean, if they're not randomized trials and they're called randomized trials, then they sh maybe they should be retracted? No? You don't think so? You disagree. Uh, they should be taken out of the literature, you know. Uh, they should. They should. They should. But, um, some of my colleagues said that they were already uh, academically retired, so. Ah. Uh, no oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, they might have retired, but the paper's still there. <laughs> The paper won't be retired ever. The paper will be there for all time. Yeah. It's very difficult. It's very difficult. In fact, I think um, uh, I told you about this one. So, you know, this, th these are the studies that we found in this meta-analysis. Um, and, they, we, you know, we found out they had all of this same mistake. And then we, uh, and then we looked at the, the papers, and they were all the same text. 
and then we found that they had the same results. And then we wrote this paper, um, does tranexamic acid, and we changed our previous conclusion. We, we, we said in 2009, we said tranexamic acid reduces bleeding after postpartum hemorrhage. But this time, we decided to tell the truth. So we wrote this paper, and we said, there is no evidence that tranexamic acid reduces bleeding in postpartum hemorrhage. Most of the trials, a large proportion of the trials, are fraudulent. What happened? So we wrote that. We, we wrote our evidence. We, we, you know, we, we, showed that, uh, we showed the baseline variables. Uh, we'd written to the authors, asked them for the data. Uh, we checked the data, found, found it was wrong in many cases. Um, we asked them about ethics committee approval. And then we checked with the ethics committee and we found many cases where there was no ethics committee approval and they said there was. And then we asked the authors and they said, well, actually, no, you're right, we didn't get ethics committee approval. So, you know, we, and we had all of this. And so we said, let's just tell the truth. And let's just tell exactly what happened. So we wrote a paper saying exactly what happened, and we sent it to the Lancet. So what happened next? More what? <laughs> well, what did the Lancet decide to do? I think it should normally publish the paper. Yeah. Oh, they weren't published in the Lancet. We wanted to publish a systematic That's review the in the Lancet, the Lancet yeah. showing that previous research was fabricated, was was fraudulent. So, what did the what would the Lancet say yes to this, or what would it say? Really? So you're the editor of the Lancet, right? If you have enough evidence to make uh, All right, let's do a role play. Right, Callistus, <laughs> come, come and sit here. You're the editor of the Lancet. So Callistus is the editor of the Lancet. Who wants to be Callistus's Bengoshi? Yeah. So... Um, you, you could be Callistus's Ben Goshi, right? right? And, and then we say, uh, so, uh, editor, here's a paper. It shows that these studies were fabricated, and we think they're fraudulent. We think it's important to tell the truth. Can you, what are you going to do? Thank you for submitting your manuscript. <laughs> <laughs> He's an expert lawyer. <laughs> they all say that. <laughs> yes. Right. What? 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 What's going through your head now? Now you're the editor of the Lancet. What's going through your head? Unfortunately, we receive many papers. Ah, yes. You must have been rejected many times. He knows, <laughs> he knows all the words for <laughs> the rejection. Unfortunately, we received so many papers. Well, I think if I'm, if I'm the editor, I'll share it with the editor. I don't want to make a decision. I think it's difficult to flip the side. Yeah. And what, what, would, you, what would your lawyer, lo lawyer, what would you be saying to him? Um. He he's thinking about publishing a paper that claims that other research is fabricated. I, I, I think it's um, the, the risk to engage in such a, a manuscript is that it's, 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 you know, it can be very controversial and mm. it can um, elicit a lot of reactions. And sometimes uh, a journal doesn't want to be involved with such issues. You know, they want to keep a good reputation and everything. So, well, I mean, um, what what's the actual risk? I mean, you, you, I think you, you're talking now. 
you're, a la you're the lawyer working for The Lancet, and the editor's thinking of publishing a paper. You're the lawyer. What, what are you worried about? What's the risk that you're worried about? I'm worried about being sued. Complaint from you're worried about being sued. OK. So what do you say to the, e what do you say to the editor? Reject the paper. Just in case we don't have all the evidence really showing that those research um, were fraudulent. So yeah. I would suggest that we don't get involved with that. You would suggest you don't get involved? Okay. But I stand for telling the public the truth. Yeah. So we've got, we've got Callistus, who has got a, a social value of wanting to tell the truth. But your lawyer is saying that mm, this is putting your journal at risk and maybe putting your job at risk. You know, if the Lancet gets sued, uh, you might lose your job. Um, so now you've got to weigh your, va your responsibility to the truth against the possibility that the journal under your you know, as a result of your decision, might get sued. What do you think? I, I want to look at the evidence that the authors have. You want to look at the evidence that the authors have? Okay. Okay, so that's very sensible. He wants now to get advice from his lawyer about this manuscript. So this manuscript's become a very special manuscript now. It actually has to be legally defensible, yeah? And the lawyer is going to advise on this. And uh, what sorts of things? She, you'll want evidence, won't you? Yes, yes. Yeah. Everything that's said in that manuscript, you'll want to see the evidence. Mm. Authors are recognizing that they have uh, manipulated data like in their case it was a, a, a call form that mm. if it could have been written that would be something good because I have uh, a document mm. where they're uh, uh, showing that they, they did something yeah. good well, can be exposed to the court. So what Tomoko says is that she rang up the authors and they said that they said it was randomized in order to get the paper published, but in fact, it wasn't. Is that evidence? Uh, on the personal note, yes, but uh, in terms of the law, I, I, I wouldn't dare go into that because it's going to be my word against theirs. You know, and it's going to be Tomoko's word theirs. against theirs. theirs. And yeah. when challenged, that you could pick up the phone and say, well, no, no, we never said that. Yes. I, I, didn't, I didn't say that at all. So it's getting more complicated, isn't it? Now, how, how do you make a living? <laughs> defending people. <laughs> you make a living defending people. Yeah. So um, you're giving this advice to the Lancet are you giving it for free? Um, I'm being paid. You're being paid. So the Lancet will have to pay you for your time to review this manuscript. And this manuscript's going to require a lot of work, isn't it? Yeah. And you're going to charge by the hour to the Lancet, aren't you? For sure. So it gets more difficult for Callistus now, because Callistus now has got to think, right, if I go to accept this paper, I have to pay legal fees to my lawyer to give me advice on it. I, have to, I risk being sued by the, you know, the angry researchers. Um, you know, I risk, you know, there's a risk I could lose my job. What are you going to do? And this is just one of the thousand papers that come across your desk. 
See, Callistus made the right decision the first time from his point of view, didn't he? He says, unfortunately, we get a lot of papers and yours isn't, you know, it, despite being very interesting, we have read it with great interest, you know. They just take one look of it and say, no way am I going to publish this, yeah? And that's what always happens. So journal editors, when they get a sense of any misconduct, they will always reject. If you're alleging misconduct in a journal article, the, thank you, Callistus, that was a, <laughs> you did a good job. <laughs> they will always reject, you know, because it's not in their interest to do anything otherwise. And so why, um, why does the public think that science is self-correcting? You know, the, the public thinks that if uh, something is published and it's wrong, that actually other scientists will make that known and it will get corrected. That, that's the general view, isn't it? That, that's, what, that's what scientists claim about research. You know, the good thing about peer-reviewed research is actually if something goes wrong, you know, other people will tell us about it and it will improve, yeah? But is it true? It's not, a tr it's not true at all. It's completely the opposite. Everybody, everybody wants to hide it, you know? Absolutely everybody. I've gone off, I've gone off statistical data monitoring. <laughs> but this is, you know, but every, you, you won't. So we, we try to, um, we, this paper, I have a, so the, the Lancet said uh, they didn't want to publish the paper because, and, and they said, you know, um, we should take it up with the universities of the authors involved. So we did do that, and the universities, I wrote to all the universities, of the, and they, they don't even write back. They don't even write back. So the universities, why would they write back, you know? So they go, oh yes, how interesting. One of our researchers, you're accusing one of our researchers of fraud, oh, we'll look into this. No, they don't do that at all. They just ignore you, you know? And like I did, I went away because, you know, I haven't got, I haven't got time and money to investigate, it's not my job. So we, so we found a journal that had published um, these papers without noticing their flaws and it was an obstetrics journal and I said to the editor, some, uh, it was an editor I knew and I said, um, you know, these, these are wrong. Uh, you know, the, the conclusions are unreliable, um, but we, he agree, they agreed to review the paper. It did go out to the lawyer, and the lawyer took all the, all the strong words out of it. <laughs> so we didn't say, you know, so it ended up existing trials are unreliable with serious flaws, you know. That's where we came to at the end, you know. So they take all of the um, anything controversial out of it. So it's a very, I think it's a broken system, really. It doesn't work very well. Anyway, back to statistics. So this use of p-values is, is very interesting. So who, who can tell me what, what a p-value is? It's, it's, it's a kind of, it's relatively, it's quite often misunderstood p-values. Does anyone want to have a go? Mm, everybody's getting very nervous now because everybody feels they should be able to explain a p-value. When we interview staff uh, in my unit, the, I ask them to explain a p-value. And, you know, they have master's degrees and PhD degrees and they, and they can't do it. Anybody want to have a go? Do you want to have a go? p-value? Yeah, that's what they're used for. But anybody, uh, anybody can say what they are, actually? The first step is I will 
hypothesis. Yes. Yes, that's it. Right, she's got it. I'll give you a job. <laughs> Most people get that wrong. So you always start with a null hypothesis, right? So the, you, the null hypothesis, in a randomized trial, what's the usual null hypothesis? The null hypothesis, uh, hypothesis that there is the baseline, the two groups, they have no difference. The, 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 the null hypothesis is that the treatment has no effect. Oh, no, yeah? yeah. Yeah, so there's no effect of the treatment. So the outcomes, so if you've got, you randomize two people to get a drug, get not to get a drug, and you follow them up, and you see a difference, the null hypothesis is that the, the treatment has no effect, yeah? So, so you've started in a really good place. You start with the null hypothesis. So whenever you see a p-value, that's the question you've got to ask. What's the null hypothesis, yeah? And that helps you to understand the p-value. So the p-value then, see, see if you can keep on going. You, you're doing well so far. Oh, um, uh, first we put out the null hypothesis. Yep. And for example, the, outcome, the, the outcomes of two groups have no difference. Yep. And then we can, uh, the two groups have, the outcomes have distributions, and we want to compare. Yes. So first of all, you have a null hypothesis. The null hypothesis is that there's no real difference. Yeah, no real difference. And, that means and then you've got some data. Yeah, I've got some data. The difference uh, is about mean, mean Yes, so you've got a null hypothesis of no difference. Then you get some data, and there's a bit of a difference. Yeah. yeah? And then the, the, the p-value is, if the null hypothesis is true, what's the probability that I would get results as large as, a difference as large as this by chance alone, isn't it? Yeah, uh, by chance alone. Yeah? So, when you, you start off with this null hypothesis, and then you've got some data, and you're saying, if that's true, how likely is this data, if that's true? And so if you've got a, a small difference, then it's, it's quite likely. But if you've got a very large difference, it gets less and less likely. So the, the p-value is the probability that if the null hypothesis is true, that you'd get results as extreme as the ones you've got, yeah? So, if you have a p-value of 0.05, what proportion of results uh, are compatible with chance alone? 5%. 5 yeah? Everybody agree with that? If, if the p-value is 0.05, then there's a 5% chance of getting a result as big as that just by chance. Now, if the p-value is 0.1, what's the probability of, of getting a result like that by chance alone? 10%. If it's 0.15, what is it? 15%. If it's 0.2, <laughs> all right, you've got it. So. <laughs> So the p-value should have a uniform distribution, yeah? So we, we, we've gone 0.5, you know, 0.1. So, you know, you should have the same uh, chance of having a p-value of uh, greater than 0.8. The same chance, you should have the same chance of getting a p-value of greater than 0.8 as getting a less than 0.2, yeah? Because the, the, the distribution is uniform, yeah? Do, do you get that? Everybody? A bit complicated? So the, um, the p-value should have 
uh, a uniform distribution. Now that that can be that's been used very well. That there's a there's a very um, have you heard of Yoshihiro Sato? No, Mitate Hospital. Anyway, it's it's a um, it's a kind of reasonably well known uh, for people who are interested in misconduct. It's a reasonably in, uh, well known uh, case of um, misconduct. Um, it's a res it's a researcher in a hospital in in Japan, and he researches on. Uh, a drug to increase bone density, yeah? And these are, and, and he has, um, he has, uh, he does, he makes randomized trials and somebody looked at the distribution of p-values in his randomized trials. The distribution of p-values for baseline variables, yeah? And this is the distribution of p-values for baseline variables. So what, what do you notice about that? So th they basically, they, they, they looked at one variable, say age, and looked at the p-value, and then recorded it. And then, you know, and he had lots and lots of trials and lots and lots of baseline variables. And this is the distribution of p-values for baseline variables. What does it show? What, what, do you, what, what does it look like? Anybody? Well, I, I said that it should have a uniform distribution. Does that look uniform? It's skewed, isn't it? Someone said skewed. And wh which direction is it skewed in? Yeah, the, 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 the p-values tend to be very close to 1, don't they? Um, there are very... Now, I told you that the distribution of p-values should be uniform, so we should expect the same number of p-values to have to be between 0.8 and 1 as to be between 0 and 0.2, yeah? But it doesn't look like that, does it? We've got a lot of very, very high p-values, you know, and not very many low p-values. In fact, what, what this researcher did is they compared the, they compared the, the kind of, uh, I don't know how they did it, sorry, but the, um, they said, well, look, we should expect a uniform distribution, but we've seen this distribution. How likely is it to get a distribution like this if the real distribution is uniform? And it was really small, you know, 3.8 times 10 to minus 100. Yeah? So then they challenged uh, this Sato, this statistician, said, said to Sato, um, these p-values don't look right. They don't look like they've been, you know, all of the p-values are too high, you know, like looking like there's very little difference in baseline variables. Uh, you should have had more extreme. You should have lower p-values. And, um, and then he acknowledged he made them all up. So he'd, he'd made up 33 randomized trials. And um, so basically he sat in his office and he wrote down, you know, you know like when you're doing a trial, you know, you, you, have, you, you have your table one, baseline variables. So he put some numbers in, you know, maybe he had a calculator. Um, anyway, the, they were all made up. Um, and it was discovered because of this uh, using the baseline values. Baseline values are really important in detecting scientific, uh, in detecting um, fraud. So, I'm surprised you don't know about this. I, I, want, I wonder if these get more they're more known outside of the country than in the country. 
this, uh, maybe you're not in particularly interested in, well, you're here, so you must be a little bit interested in, in misconduct. <laughs> because you're not interested. <laughs> but anyway, so far, so what we've talked about so far is the use of statistics to, um, to check the integrity of the data. But it's almost checking the integrity of the data after the trial is over. I mean, it's, it's, it's useful for people who are doing systematic reviews. But the, and, and the message is, look at the baseline variables. But it, the real value of using statistics, I think, is actually while the study is going. Now, we, I'm, in, I'm doing a, a trial at the moment called the CRASH-3 trial. And it's, a, it's the same drug. We do, we're very interested in this drug, tranexamic acid, you can tell. And um, now we're doing a, a trial to see if tranexamic acid can re improve outcome in patients with head injuries. So basically, when you have a head injury, bam, you hit your head, you start bleeding inside your brain. And we wonder, if you give tranexamic acid really early, can you stop this bleeding into the brain? So you, you, you get patients who... This is a patient who had a head injury, and this is, this is a CT scan, a picture of his brain, and he, he's, this, is what I, this is the bleeding into his brain he had when he came into the hospital, and then 24 hours later, it's got much bigger. And so what we want to do is, when the patient comes into hospital, give them tranexamic acid now, and see if we can stop that turning into that. Yeah? So this is a trial that's ongoing with randomized 10,000 patients, we've got 3,000 patients to go. Um, it's going all over the world, it's, it's in the University of Tokyo, um, Tokyo Medical and Dental are recruiting, um, Senshu Hospital in Osaka, uh, so quite, quite a few hospitals in Japan, but lots of hospitals internationally. And we use statistics to check the integrity of the data. And so we look for unusual patterns in the data. We use, look for unusual, unusual data distributions. And we look for non-random data when you would expect to, to find randomness. Now, one of the things that we find in the trial is that we want patients to be recruited really early, really soon after their head injury, yeah? Because this bleeding starts really soon after the, you know, if you fall off your bicycle, or you get hit by a car, you start bleeding into your brain straight away. And if you're going to stop it, you have to actually intervene very quickly. But intervening very quickly is quite difficult, yeah? Because actually most patients, uh, by the time you've found that there's a patient and you call an ambulance and the ambulance comes, and that, you know, they put the patient in the ambulance and they take the ambulance to hospital. Um, and then the patient's got to get out of the ambulance, into the emergency department. Doctor comes along, asks, finds out what's happened to the patient, and then gives the trial treatment. Yeah? It's very difficult to randomize, to randomize people really quickly. And so usually we see that most hospitals, of all the patients in the trial, we get a distribution of time to treatment like this. Some hospitals, some hosp you know, like about 10% of the patients are recruited in the first hour. 30% uh, of patients are recruited in the second hour. And 60% of patients are recruited in the third hour. You know, so it's very hard to recruit really quickly. It gets a little bit easier to recruit in the second hour. Now, we had one hospital that we thought, we had this distribution. Wow, that's really interesting. In that particular hospital, it seems that they can recruit lots of patients in the first hour. And actually, they can recruit more patients in the first hour than they can recruit in the second and third. You know? So that's the distribution for the whole trial. And that's the distribution in one hospital. Yeah? What do you think? Is it suspicious? Yeah? You're nodding over there. You think so? You think it doesn't look right? <laughs> You'd expect there to be some reason. OK. Well, this, is a, this was a hospital in Pakistan. Yeah. 
And, um, and so what I did is I, I saw that and I thought, I thought like you, there must be some reason for this. Yeah? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so uh, when I saw this, I had the same impression as you. It's very strange. There must be some reason for it. And so I, uh, I called the hospital in Pakistan, and I spoke to the doctor. And the doctor said, ah, oh, yeah, it's my hospital is on a really busy road. In the middle of the town, there's a very busy road. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a wide road, it's a big road, and the local boys have motorbikes, and they like doing what we, we I don't know what, if you, wheelies, you know wheelies? You, you actually go, whoo, like that, and you know, you, you, the front wheel comes off the ground, and then you go along on the back wheel, <laughs> and then you go down, yeah? And he said, the local boys like doing wheelies on the big road outside my hospital, and, um, and of course, they fall off and hit their head. And, uh, and so we get them really quickly. So that he, that's what he said. Now, what do you think now? Is that, is that a good enough reason? I'm not sure. <laughs> yeah. So I, I can't remember Why is the race to the hours? Why it? Why is the race to the hour you recruit? Well, what, 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 what he was saying is that the reason we can recruit so many pe patients within the first hour in this particular hospital is because the injuries happen just outside. Yeah, because if the hospital is here, there's a big road here, and the boys do this, bang their head, and then they're in the hospital. Yeah? What do you think? Is that a good, who thinks that's a convincing explanation? You, sh you don't think so? Not really? Why not? Seems to be made up. So I thought it seemed to be made up. So I went on Google Maps. <laughs> so I went on Google Maps. Now you can't see it very well, but this is, this is Google Maps. And I, I looked at the hospital, and, and the hospital is there. And there's the main road. And actually, on, on this Google map, you can actually uh, you can see the main road, you can see the hospital, and you can see little dots. And you think, well, maybe those are the boys doing the wheelies. <laughs> you know? Hmm, maybe, maybe this is true. Yeah, what do you think? Maybe this is true. There is a big main road outside this hospital. And maybe the boys are doing wheelies. Check the age. Yeah. Anyway, I was still suspicious. <laughs> so I went there, right? So you go on an airplane, you go to Pakistan, you, you look a long way from London, and it's all hot, and you know, and then you get in a car, and you drive for two hours, and you get to the hospital. Um, actually, no, you drive for four hours, you get to the hospital. There's a place called Narawal. Oh, I shouldn't say where it is. Um, you forget that, please. Um, I, I got to this place after a long drive, and um, I looked at the patient's notes. They weren't nothing to do with wheelies at all. <laughs> These patients had come from all over the place. The, the, the data were just, they just were, they weren't accurate. What they'd recorded is the time from hospital arrival to receipt of the trial treatment. What we asked them to record is the time from the injury to receipt of, of the trial treatment. They were recording the time of arrival at hospital to receipt of the trial treatment. The data were wrong. So even though they gave you a, an explanation over the phone, the data were completely wrong. And we found at that hospital actually lots of the data were wrong. Um, they started, they, when they started off in the trial, um, they, 
when they started off in the trial, they were putting quite well, they're putting lots of patients in, but we were monitoring the death rate, because the death death is the outcome measure in the trial. We were monitoring the death rate, and the death rate was very low. So we're thinking they're putting lots of mild patients in because they're not dying. Um, and so we said, look. We don't want you to put so many mild patients in. Just put your severe patients in. We said, just put your patients with, who, I don't know if you're all familiar, but there's something called the Glasgow Coma Scale. You'll, you'll be familiar, but not everybody's familiar. Glasgow Coma Scale. It's a, a scale that measures the degree of unconsciousness. And we said, only put patients with a Glasgow Coma Scale of eight or less into the trial. And when I was looking through the patient's notes, so you basically after this four-hour drive, you sit down in a hot room in this hospital and you start looking through the notes. And first of all, we noticed that all the times were wrong. Uh, they got that wrong. And then I look, started looking at the, at the GCS. And I noticed the GCS is made up of different components. There are three components that give you this score. So you can get a score of eight from many, in many different ways. So I looked at GCS8 made up of 332. GCS8332. 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 They were all GCS8332. And I thought, oh, this isn't right. And then I actually got back to London and, and actually because we did a, we did a, a very big trial in head injury a few years ago, we could see how likely it is. The, the 332 combination is a very rare combination, actually. You don't get 332 very often. So not only was there too many of these 332s, but actually the, the actual 332 combination is a very rare combination. Anyway, so then I got a very bad vibe um, from the investigator. He didn't ask me very much. He said he wanted a trip to London um, and he wanted a new computer, which was a bad, you know, it, it, I was getting a very bad. Anyway, we, we decided there and then we said, right, OK, I don't think you're suited for this trial. And we're going to uh, we, we stopped recruitment then and we haven't restarted. Uh, so. So we used, through the use of statistics, we found this, that the data from this particular center were unreliable. And usually, usually we find that, um, usually we find there's something wrong. Uh, and usually it's a sort of innocent, innocent mistake. Um, and we can put it right and, and then we can start going again. In this particular case, we decided that it was too sloppy, you know, didn't understand, you know, we said, anyway, we, 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 closed, we closed that hospital down. Some, sometimes I go to places and, I, and I, find, I find very honest explanations. So, for example, there was one hospital in Colombia that, in a, one of our previous trials, that um, we were seeing the data and the data looked really strange. Patients who have a, a normal heart rate, but the respiratory rate is zero. Yeah? So the heart's, go, the heart's beating, but they're not breathing. Now that's strange. Yeah? Do you agree? In your clinical practice, Tomoko? <laughs> Never happens, Unless right? The Unless the monitor's off. Yeah, but we, so we had quite a few patients who had a rec they recorded the heart rate as 100 and 120 and the breathing rate as zero. So that means someone's heart's beating and not breathing. Usually if you stop breathing, your heart stops too. Um, so that's, it looked very strange. Anyway, we went there and to investigate, convinced that this was fraud, um, well, suspecting fraud, and we found out that um, it was an intensive care unit. All the patients were on ventilators. And so even though the, the because the patient was on a, on a ventilator, 
they, they decided that the patient wasn't breathing themselves. So they recorded their respiratory rate as zero. So it was just an honest mistake. So, you know, um, anyway. And so we find, usually we find it's just honest mistakes and you can correct things. Um, you can, looking at distributions of data is very, is very hu helpful as well. And um, let me, so we, we, look at, we look at the distributions of the data. Uh, we look at things, something called the coefficient of variation. Now, let me see what, what you think of this. So this is data from the CRASH-3 trial. And these are the blood pressures of the patients in the trial. Now, these are, these are the site numbers. Um, uh, I, I know the identity of, but I, but I don't want to share the identity of them all. Which, which, site looks, which site would you be worried about there? Are you worried about any site there? Do they look all right? No? Anybody? So D1, you're worried about D1 because the blood pressure is high. And you... Uh, L1, L2, and L3 are too similar. L1, L2, and L3? Too similar. Too similar. Hmm? Okay. So we've got D1 because the blood pressure is high, L1, L2, and L3. Okay. Now I'm going to show you... I've shown you the mean... Now I'm going to show you the standard deviation, yeah? The standard deviation of the blood pressures. Now, are you, do you have any concerns about, other, do you have the same concerns or different concerns? Yeah. Who said something there? D, D, N. Ah, right, so this is a new one now, so you've got, DN, why are, you why are you worried about DN? Too low. So you're worried about DN because the, the variability is too low. So the, the, usually there's a quite a big spread of data. The standard deviation is quite wide. But in this case, it's, it's quite narrow. Yeah? Any, anybody else interested, worried about anything? Well, th this is the, w these are the p-values for these Levine tests, right? The null hypothesis in a Levine test is that all the standard deviations are the same. And the p-value is that if the null hypothesis is true, that the standard deviations of all these variables are the same, how likely it is that we'll see a difference uh, from the, the site one to the overall one by chance alone. And so the ones that come out are DN came out. It's a very low variability, yeah? These data are not very variable, and, and it's a very st uh, statistically significant one. Uh, the L1, L2, and L3, uh, they all also come out as having very low... Um, so you, you spotted those because you thought these were so similar. Um, and the variability is very low as well, so it's looking more like it. And uh, the, the Levine's test is highly significant, and, and the coefficient of variation is on the low side. So we've identified which hospitals we want to have a closer look at, yeah? So what we do is, we, you know, we, you see, what, what happens with these big trials? We've got these... We've got this, this trial, it's, got, it, it's recruiting patients in, I don't know, 30 countries. It's recruiting patients from about 350 hospitals. Now, we can't go to 350 hospitals in 20 countries because it's too expensive to do that, yeah? So what we try and do is we try and focus our activities using statistics to tell us where we might have problems. 
And in this case, statistics identified L1 and L2, L3, and DN. You know, and we went to those hospitals, and, um, and there were problems there. Um, in, in some cases, you know, these, hosp these L1, L2, and L3 are actually different units in the same hospital. And um, we found that they all came in through the same emergency department, and there weren't very many blood pressure measuring machines. So quite often, the nurses, don't know how they did this, but they estimated blood pressure <laughs> without measuring it. You know, so you look at, like I would say, Callistus's blood pressure is 130 over 70. You know, because he's awake and nice and pink, or you know, he looks well perfused. So um, I haven't measured it; I've just estimated it. You know, so we found that in this particular hospital, the nurses were kind of estimating is too kind a word, really. It's guessing. They were just guessing the blood pressure, and so what? What? What you see is they're always 120. Everybody says, what's the blood pressure, 120? Because that's considered the normal blood pressure. So if they look at you and you're talking, you look healthy, they say your blood pressure is 120. And there's very little variability. And so, uh, I mean, blood pressure is not the most important variable in this trial. Uh, but that variable is a signal. Uh, it's a good te test variable to find out if there's a problem and, and you can look into it. In more detail. So that so we use statistics to find problems, and, and we go and have a. The the other one we we use that uh, a lot is something called the runs test. Um, I don't know how, how many of you are familiar with the runs test. Uh, Nohiro, are you familiar with the runs test? Yeah. So the, the runs test is a really useful test. I'll just expla uh, ex explain it. You get, a, you get a series of values, right? They're, they're separate values from, from different patients. So for example, um, say patients come into hospital. Uh, you know, one patient comes in, and they have a certain time to treatment. Another patient comes in, they have another time to treatment. There's no good reason to think that they're the time to treatment of that patient should influence the time to treatment of the next patient. They should be independent. I mean, occasionally you might imagine something like, suppose there was a big bus crash, and, an and one huge ambulance went and got all the patients in and carried them to hospital at the same time. That doesn't happen very often, right? So you should expect the values to be independent. And so, a r you get, these are just any numbers made up, but it's to show you what a run is. So here we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight numbers. We've got eight numbers, and it happens to be the median is 41. Yeah? Now a run of values is a series of values um, that are less than or greater than the median. So this is a, so this is one run, so 40, 30, and 10 are all less than 41, so that's one run. Then 79 is higher than 41, so that's one run. 20 is lower than 41, that's one run. Four, 50, 47, and 42 are higher, yeah? You got it? So that, that's a, that's, there, there are runs. And so in this data set, there's four run, in this piece of data, there's four runs. One, two, three, four. So one run, two run, three run, four runs. And, and that's what a run is. Now, there's a, the, the, uh, do you use this stator? Do you use stator here or you use SAS or something else? What, what computer program do you use? You use them all, OK. So in Stata, there's a Stata command that you can do a runs test. And, it, uh, and so in this data, there were, um, there were eight observations, and there were four runs. And you can do this runs test, and it's, there's no significant difference. In general, 
the, the number of runs is about half the number of observations. So you, you get the number of runs is half the number of observations. Um, now we've got, so we, we use this runs test for the times to treatment because we expect time to treatment, you know, e at this particular patient's time to treatment should be independent of the next one. And um, so I've got two bits of data now I want you to look at. And I want to tell you, so this one, can you count how many runs there are there? I mean, you can't, can you? It's very difficult. So, and then I've got another data set, this one. So you just read them like this. You go round this way, round this way. So the median is 1.8, so that, that's one run to there, and that's another run, and that's another run to there. But it's, it's not easy. It's not easy. So what I'm showing you is actually that sometimes you can look at data and see strange things, but sometimes you can't, and you need computers to help you. And so in this case, you know, there were 25 runs for site A. And when, you, when we look at site A results, do we do a runs test? There are 54 observations, 25 runs. Or, you know, the number of runs is approximately half the number of observations. There was no significant uh, autocorrelation. But in site B, um, there were 72 observations and 26 runs. So there were less, there were less runs than you'd expect. Uh, and they, th this was evidence of autocorrelation. And in fact, because I could only get so much data on the slide, um, I didn't put all of the data. But the probability got really low. So we found an autocorrelation in this, in this data. And um, uh, you know, it was this particular hospital here. Uh, and it was time to treatment as well, um, time to treatment. And the probability, the p-value for the runs test was very low. So we went to this particular hospital. And again, we, find, we found there was a problem with the, with the data collection. Um, they weren't, um, it, the data weren't being accurately recorded. In, the, in this case, what happened is the investigator realized that the, um, that they didn't have all of the information needed to calculate time to treatment. So she kind of estimated it. Uh, so she sat in her office, basically, and, and just thought, well, it'll be about this. It'll be about this. It'll be about this. And the thing about humans is we're not very good random, gen random number generators. Yeah? Humans are very bad at randomness. You know, we, we're not very good at making up random numbers. Generally, we underestimate chance, you know. The real data is much more varied than we make up. We have an idea of randomness, but we're very poor at generating random numbers. So the good thing about that is that if people are not recording data, real data, and they're actually estimating it or making it up, the, you see less randomness in it than you really should do. And you tend to see less variability as well. And so those ways of, of, of uh, detecting data. But, I w so I've talked about statistics. This is Danielle. And she's the data manager on the CRASH-3 trial. And she found that data problem before the statistician did. So what, what I, I um, so good data managers are actually really important as well, you know. And so when you have a data, when you've got a data manager in your study, actually they're a really important part of your study. You want, to, you want them to understand all of the study as much as possible. 
because they'll help you then. You know, they can spot things going, going on. So I've had, I've had data managers who've spotted all sorts of problems, like um, we had one, the first crash trial, we had um, questionnaire. There, there was a patient questionnaire at six months to ask the patient how they're getting on after their head injury. And we had one particular site, because the data managers organize the data, and they see things that you wouldn't. So this, well, not this one, but the previous data manager, she noticed that all the questionnaires from a particular site were written in the same color ink. You know, they were written in, in this blue ink. And actually, when you, get, when you get all of the sites and you get all of their questionnaires, because these are going out to patients, you know, some come back in black ink, some come back in pencil, some come back in red ink. But in this particular hospital, all there was all blue ink. <laughs> yeah? So she spotted that, and it turned out that they were, they were being filled out by the girlfriend of the investigator. So, um, you know, so we, we found out this, and we had to go send the questionnaires out again to the patients and get new data. And then this is another data manager in the crash trial, and she found something. Well, all of these, all of the patients in this trial have head injury, and we want, uh, we want to know the cause of death. We're very interested in the cause of death because the trial treatment will affect some causes of death but not others. So we ask, ask the doctors at a particular site to tell us a little story about how the patient died. And there was, what she noticed is that all the patients at a particular site had the same story. So this patient developed signs, the, you know, his pharyngeal and tracheal reflexes became absent, he became pulseless and blood pressure shooted down to nil. He became pulseless and blood pressure shooted down. He became pulseless. It's all the same story. So what this, the doctor in this particular hospital had got, I don't know, lazy, yeah? And rather than write out the same story, r rather than uh, writing out the story in every particular case, cutting and pasting the same story, and statistics couldn't have spotted this one. You know, you can't get statistics to, you know, I mean, you maybe some clever machine learning or something, but, but a clever human can spot things like this. So you want to have the best use of statistics and, the, and, and clever humans as well, and they can help you. So what, um, to finish off then, usually... Statisticians are involved at the start of a study and at the end of a study. And in the middle, they have no, they're not involved at all. I'm saying that if you want to improve the quality of the data, statistics can be involved in the middle. And it's much better because it's prevention. Yeah? You're actually, you don't want to find out about data data, poor quality data at the end, when you can't do anything about it. You want to find out about poor quality at the time it's happening so you can improve it, yeah? So statistical methods can and should be used to improve data quality. Statistical, statistical methods is not a substitute for good data management. And so you shouldn't try and say it's all the, the machines can take care of it. We don't need clever humans. You do need clever humans. Preventing data, preventing data problems is better, is better than detecting them. And you focus on the data collection system rather than allocating blame. Now, that's been a really difficult one for me because uh, you, know, you, you, you feel, the, the, you know, you, basically, I do these big trials. And you spend about eight years of your life working on one trial. Yeah? And you can only do so many trials, and then you die, you know, because you don't live forever. So 
you put a big part of your life into these studies and you find these investigators who are not taking it seriously you, and, and you get, it makes me angry, you know? And I want to, I want to tie them to the chair and da, da, da. <laughs> How dare you! <laughs> That's my Im impulse is to do that, yeah? But it's the wrong impulse. <laughs> so I've got, fortunately I work with other people who are more sensible than me. And, um, and uh, if there's a problem with data quality, they say it's a system failure, right? So when we had the doctor in this particular site in Pakistan, who is making up all the same GCS, you know, 332, 332, 332, time to treatment was all wrong. What we've got to think about is how we select investigators. You know, are we selecting the right investigators for this study? You know, do we, are we selecting the right investigators? Do we uh, give them feedback early enough? That's one thing, that, a big thing that's changed because, um, so for example, if I show you this really strange looking data, this, you know, th there was 308 patients here. 308, 106, 100, so actually 400 patients had been recruited before we started to see statistical evidence of a problem. It's a bit too late, isn't it? The thing about statistics is actually you need, you need some numbers. So what we, you know, we're starting to improve our data collection systems by actually, you know, let somebody recruit the first 10 patients and then review the notes of those 10 patients, right? Audit the data you collect from the first 10 patients. So, so what we do is we, we do it by Skype usually. We, we, because um, we don't want to keep on, you know, flying around the world. So we, we do it by Skype and we get the, you know, we say, right. And the good thing about Skype is you can just hold the notes up to the, to the, the camera. You say, show me this patient's blood pressure. You say, there it is in the notes. And, um, you know, uh, show me where, it, how did you work out the time to treatment? You know. He said, well, we worked out from the, you know, when the, when the ambulance was called. Show me, show me the time that says the ambulance is called. And so we, we try and tackle problems really much earlier. And so even though, so actually moving away from a culture of blame and thinking, thinking, of, thinking of data quality as a system feature is much more, is much more useful. And that's what we're going to talk about tomorrow. T tomorrow we're going to talk about a, a very um, kind of an, a, a very high profile, another Japanese case of research misconduct, a very well, a very famous, well, well, I don't know if it's famous in Japan, but it's w very well known out of Japan. I'm only doing that, uh, I don't think there's, misconduct is no more common in Japan than anywhere else. I'm, I, I don't think there's any evidence that that's the case. Uh, so I've chosen examples because, um, because I'm in Japan. <laughs> yeah. if, I was in, if I was giving this course in Korea or Nigeria, I would choose examples from those places. So tomorrow we'll look at a very a high profile case of um, misconduct and look about you know, how, the, how the university and, and, and different groups have responded. And, um, I want to consider the issue about whether we consider uh, misconduct as a individual failing, you know, a rotten apple, or a system failing, a rotten barrel. Yeah. So, any questions about um, about what we've talked about so far? Yeah. Uh, this statistical method 
cancer can also implode in the uh, other field, like public health. Mm. Yeah. So, t like, um, some of it can and some of it can't. So, uh, the good thing about clinical trial is that you're comparing two groups that should only differ by chance alone. So all the stuff related to baseline variables, that only applies in clinical trials. It wouldn't apply in a cohort study, yeah? So if you have a cohort study, you know that, you know, you don't expect them to be different, yeah? At baseline. So you might say, let's look at if smoking causes lung cancer, you may take a group of smokers, a group of non-smokers. Now, there's no re they're going to be different from many things apart from the smoking, aren't they? So, randomized trials give you this special opportunity because randomization gives you two groups that should differ only by chance. But all of the other things about data distributions, yeah? So if you were doing, what sort of study are you doing? Mm. Normal way in public health. Yeah. Yes, so okay. So, okay, so say you were doing a questionnaire survey and you had lots of hospitals, yeah? Or lots of, uh, y yeah, you might have um, di different villages collecting data, right? So you might look at the overall distribution of the variable, say, it could be like age or the average. Um, the average family size or something like that, and look at that by village. And you, you, might, you might look at the distribution of the data, look at the average family size and the distribution, and you might find that in one particular village, uh, the variability of family size is very small. And you might find that, you know, and I, I, I was talking to, this happened in the London School of Hygiene. Um, there was a study uh, in Africa uh, where related to HIV, and they found that one of the, one of the data collection sites, the, the data had very low variability. And they investigated, and in that particular site, uh, rather than going to the trouble of uh, distributing the questionnaires and collecting the data, the researcher in that particular site had filled in the questionnaires. Um, yeah. So you can use some of them, but not all of them. More questions? No, I, I, we just go and, um, no, uh, we, we don't pretend we're a patient, no, you know. <laughs> <laughs> they wheel me in on the trolley, <laughs> and I'm looking, pretending to be unconscious. No, I, I just go in and um, I, um, we, we go to the hospital, uh, I go and sit in the emergency department, the few, about three weeks ago, I was I was back in Pakistan, um, and I spent I spent a couple of days in the emergency department and just uh, watching how the patients get recruited and. They don't know who you are. Oh yeah, they know who I am. Yeah, they know I'm from London and I'm from the trial, um, but you still find out an awful lot. Yeah, you just see how things are done and and they, and they. Pe people usually just tell you, you know, this, the, 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 this machine doesn't work, so I, I kind of, I estimate, <laughs> you know, it's usually, I think it's the most useful thing that I do, actually, is actually um, see how it really works, right? When you do these trials, or when you do any research, uh, you've really got to 
get into it, you know, and, and really see how it works. So what sort of studies are you doing? You know, because what you can do is you can sit in the university and, you know, send out instructions to the world, <laughs> you know, and then receive back news from the world and then do your p-values and um, it doesn't work that way. You've actually got to go and you've really got to investigate, you know, get into, into the... And then you, you know, it, it really helps you, uh, it helps you make better studies because sometimes, you, you know, you, you're doing things... You, you, sometimes you make, you, you have expectations that, that are really impossible, you know, and so if you see what it's really like. I mean, always with me, when I go, I realize I have to simplify things. Things being too complicated is a real problem. Because usually, the people who are doing the data, if, if you're getting doctors to collect data, collecting data isn't, isn't, isn't their main job. You know, they, they, they've got more important things to do than your study, usually. So if, if you want them to do it well, you have to actually mi minimize, you know, cut a lot of things out. Yeah. Do you get the opportunity to go to sites? Have you, have you been to? Yes. Yeah? Where are your sites? Uh, Taiwan. In Taiwan? In Taiwan, yeah. So uh, are you from Taiwan? Yes. So you go there and you? Yes. I, uh, last year, it's uh, my quantitative study, and this is a quantitative study. Yeah. Yeah. And I can check the reliability now and to revise the questionnaire. Yeah. Again. And then when you give it, who's going to administer it? Uh, I, I just uh, went to the school, uh, the high school, and to distribute my questionnaire. Ah, you distribute your questionnaire in the high school? In the high school, yes. Okay. Yes. And you, um, so you distribute it and you collect it in? Okay. Yes. All right. Yeah. And, th and that's good because um, if you're in, in the actual classroom, you can, uh, uh, you can find out what's going on. I mean, it could, it could easily be that the, because, you know, sometimes they give it to the teacher, don't they? Yeah. You yes. give the questionnaires for the teacher, the teacher. Now, you don't know what the teacher's going to say to the children, do you? <laughs> yeah. No. So the what's the answer to this one? It sounds <laughs> You have to be there to yes. see what's happening. Yes. Yeah. Anybody else have experience going to site and actually seeing how things work and being surprised or not surprised? Yeah? T tell us about your experience. Is this in Kenya? Yes. I actually came back like three days ago. Ah, okay. So I to, mine was in the household, in the community. So mm. Mm. And then book them for for the test for the next day. Like I was collecting data on diabetes and hypertension. So we have to do the test in the morning before they take breakfast. Mm. There are a lot of um, things you have to adjust. Some people don't turn up. Some people come when they have already had mm. their breakfast. So you have to book them again. Some people um, they. They, want, they wanted to do the questionnaire, but they don't want the test anymore. Mm. So it's very interesting, isn't it? So because I think when you st you actually get involved like that, you start to see the study from the perspective of the data collectors. Yeah. Sometimes they get very tired, like we have to get to the field by 6 a.m. Mm. And because then after 
eight people have had breakfast. So mm. waking them very early, like four or five a.m. So I have to give them time the whole afternoon to sleep for the next. Mm. So this breakfast thing is very <laughs> breakfast. Is breakfast a dichotomous variable? That's the question. So what constitutes breakfast? Yeah. Yeah. So we tell them not to eat anything. Yeah. So so some people will say I haven't eaten anything but I drank some tea. Yeah. So it's already <laughs> <laughs> Well, I'm one of those. Whenever I go for I lo I'm a coffee addict, yeah. Coffee is my I, I don't drink alcohol or anything but I love coffee. And as soon as I wake up in the morning, I have to have a cup of coffee really quickly. Yeah. Um I I just I just want a cup of coffee immediately. And so whenever I have to go for my cholesterol test and they say, don't drink anything, I just lie. I have, I have a cup of coffee always. I might not put milk in it, but I, I, don't think, I don't think there's much cholesterol in coffee, is there? But anyway, the doctor says, have you had anything? No. <laughs> but I've had my cup of coffee. <laughs> so anyway. Any, but any more experiences that people want to share? No? Yes, please. Local monitoring. Yeah, yeah we, um, it's all about cost effectiveness, isn't it, really? Because the, it, it, I think it's a, it's a question of cost effectiveness. If you could, mm, so it's a very interesting question, I think. See, on the one hand, you could check every single variable, couldn't you? You're doing a study, and you could check every single variable. So somebody collects, a data, somebody collects data, and then you have somebody else to go and collect it again. And you check every single variable. Now, the thing is, that would, give you, that would reduce the measurement error. That would reduce the error, but it'd be quite expensive, wouldn't it? Now, the thing is, there are two kinds of error in, in studies. There are, there, well, there's, there's probably more kinds of error, but essentially, there is measurement error and random error. Yeah? Now, if you put a lot of your money into reducing measurement error, the, the study will be smaller because you've spent all your money on, on, on reducing measurement error. Usually you've got a fixed budget, haven't you? So if you put a lot of effort into reducing measurement error, random error will go up. And so you're always dealing with this balance, right, of measurement error and random error. So in our studies, what we find is that the, the reason why we, we like statistical monitoring is because it's very cost effective. We can um, have lots of centers all around the world. And most people do everything OK. Lots of centers, lots of data collection really reduce random error. And then we want to be as cost effective as possible for reducing measurement error. So we do statistical data checking and only go to those places. So I think your question is a very good one. It's about, but I think it's, a, it's about cost effectiveness. And what people don't realize is you're always making a trade-off between the size of the study and data checking. You can check lots of data, but the study will be smaller. 
If you do less checking, the study can be bigger. So it's getting the right balance between data checking and size of the study. I prefer big studies with minimum data checking, actually, because what I found is that, uh, especially where you get a variable, where you get a primary outcome that's really clear, like death. So in our studies, you know, I've, I don't think I've ever found errors in the recording of death. You know, that said, the patient's dead when they're actually alive, or the patient's alive when they're actually dead. You know, it's always recorded really, really well, that. And so actually, because, it, because primary endpoint is death, you just go for big numbers. Yeah. It was a good question, that one. Awarimashita. <laughs> Have we? OK, well, I look forward to seeing you tomorrow. And tomorrow we're going to talk about responsibilities and things like that, rotten apples, rotten barrels. On Monday, uh, we're supposed to have two sessions, but I'm, I'm not sure if maybe we... On Monday, there was going to be a, 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 a meeting in the morning and then one in the afternoon. Is the afternoon convenient? I was thinking we might not. Yeah? In the morning, what I want to do is I want to give you some scenarios, right? Maybe we'll do some more role play. I thought you were very good as the editor of The Lancet. <laughs> And you're a good lawyer, too. <laughs> so I like, I d I like doing this role play because, it's, it, one, it's fun. And, it, it, and the, the other thing, it's sort of, um, I don't know, you start to feel what, what you would, might do. You know? So I want to do some role playing of what you might do if somebody uh, encouraged you to change data or you noticed the data had been fabricated or falsified. Who would you tell? Those sorts of things. Yeah? So I'm going to, on Monday, we'll, I, I think we'll, may, maybe we'll get some of these, move some of these ch tables back and we'll put the chairs in a circle and we'll have some, uh, I think it's be in oh, it's going to be in another room? Oh, yeah. Okay. Well, we'll try and get some, we'll do some role play, but, but do come for that because I, I want some good acting and uh, I think that can really help because um, it's, you know, sort of what you would really do in that situation. It's quite difficult. It's a very difficult area. Okay. Good. And there'll be a certificate at the end. Sure may sure. <laughs> so you have to come on Monday, otherwise you don't get a certificate. <laughs> and, and then don't forget, if you get a chance to, to read about this story, about in the news or on the internet uh, about the uh, Tokyo thing. <laughs>